Hello everyone and welcome to today's Passport to the Past for Schools. Today we're going to be doing Drawing on the Past, Gloucestershire Castles and the Cathedral. Uh, today's session is suitable for Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 um, and it includes lots of national curriculum links today. Um, we're going to be uh, focusing on history, RE and also art and design. So before we start the session, um, we are going to be doing a lot of activities in today's session and you will need the following. Uh, first of all, um, it's really great if you've printed out the Passport to the Past resources for today's session and you can find them at the link that you can see um, in front of you at the moment. And the pages particularly, there are several, but the pages particularly um, that will be useful to have are the five you see in front of you. This is the fact file with the picture gallery and the reason this is going to be really useful is when we go to our first video to meet Becky the archivist um, she is going to be talking about the cathedral um, and these pictures will illustrate everything that she's talking about so you can put an image um, to the words that she's using um, so that would be really helpful if you've got it um, if you haven't don't worry it doesn't mean you can't uh, participate um, but they're there um, if you want to download them later um, we're also going to be doing a lot of drawing in today's session. In fact, um, much of the session is going to be dedicated to that. Um, in order to participate, you will need a few pieces of paper. You'll need a pencil. You'll need a ruler. Um, you could use a sharp edge if you don't have a ruler, but a ruler is slightly better. A rubber and sharpener would also be quite useful. Um, and you'll need a hard surface to work upon. OK, so if you haven't got those yet, now would be a good time to go and grab them while we start the session. Thank you. So first of all, hello and welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in today, we're going to be doing the following. We're going to be meeting Becky. Now, Becky is the Gloucester Cathedral Archivist, and she's going to be telling us about her job and a little bit about the history of the cathedral and all the best bits about it. We're going to be learning about what a cathedral and a castle is. And finally, we're going to be going on to learn how to draw in perspective. And we're going to be doing this with artist Jamie. And it's going to uh, begin with a couple of, sort of smaller activities and going on to show you how to draw a really fantastic castle. Honestly, you'll be amazed at what you're going to be able to produce in today's session. So first of all, what is a cathedral? Well, a cathedral is a large church. Uh, Christians worship in a cathedral and to become a cathedral a church needs a cathedral and what that is is a very special chair and you can see that in the image in front of you and a cathedral is a chair where the bishop sits so if you don't have this chair um, you wouldn't be a cathedral. So a cathedral has many features and we won't touch on all of them, but just to give you an idea of some of the key things that they might have. Um, first of all, they generally have a tower and sometimes it has a spire on top of it. Uh, they generally have bells to call people um, to come and worship. Uh, they tend to have an altar and we can see one there from Gloucester Cathedral. All these pictures are from Gloucester Cathedral. Um, you need to have seating for worshippers and in somewhere like Gloucester Cathedral there are lots of different areas to sit. Um, you also need to have a lectern and that is like a big beautiful stand normally in the shape of, of an eagle as you can see in front of you and that's where they put the bible and that's where they uh, read from in services. Um, you also need to have an organ to go with the music and stained glass windows are also very important in most cathedrals and we can see the great east window in front of you now. Um, monuments and memorials are also very common in cathedrals and Gloucester Cathedral is no exception. Uh, the one at the top that you can see is the memorial uh, to King Edward II. Now he was murdered just a few miles from Gloucester Cathedral and that's why he came to be buried there and that's his memorial. And we also have this slightly different uh, memorial. This is quite, a, I think this is a really beautiful one. Um, this is to a young lady called Elizabeth, and she was only 17 years old when she died. And she had a memorial put in the cathedral. And you can see that she's placed there with her baby. Um, there's also the cloisters and a garden. Um, there are the cloisters in front of you. And cloisters are long walkways, normally in the shape of a square. And then in the middle of that square, there is a garden. And there you can see um, the garden at Gloucester Cathedral. 
And you also often have a library um, in a cathedral because quite often they have lots of very important books um, and very old books. So Gloucester Cathedral is about a thousand years old. Um, it was a huge building that was built at the time with some very simple tools. Today we would have a lot more machinery and cranes and things like this, but um, they actually made this wonderful building with actually just some very basic tools. Um, did you know that the Harry Potter films, Sherlock, Doctor Who and lots of other films and TV series have used Gloucester Cathedral as a film location and you might recognise if you visit there, if you go into the cloisters, you might recognise that particularly from the Harry Potter films. And the cathedral was almost destroyed 500 years ago, that this was a time when lots of churches and cathedrals were being pulled down. Um, but fortunately, King Henry VIII, he was very respectful of the fact that um, his predecessor, Edward II, had been buried there. Um, and so he decided to turn it into a cathedral instead of pulling it down, which is very good for us. And the inside of the church is also a graveyard. This might quite surprise you to hear this, but in fact, um, throughout the history of churches and cathedrals, uh, very important people were buried underneath the floors in the building. And if you look down when you're walking around somewhere like Gloucester Cathedral, you'll see there's actually lots of gravestones um, making up the floor. And you can see a couple of them on the image in front of you. So that might quite surprise you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hear from Becky and Becky is the archivist for the Gloucester Cathedral. Now, don't forget, if you've printed out the picture gallery from um, uh, the resources, um, this would be a good time to have them there. Or if you've got them on a different screen, that would be useful too. And you'll be able to follow uh, what Becky says by using those pictures. But like I said, if you haven't got them, don't worry, just give it a listen. All right. Thank you. We're here in the Cathedral Library with the Cathedral Archivist, Becky Phillips. Um, Becky has kindly agreed to tell us a little bit about her job as the Cathedral Archivist and some things that she knows about the history of this ancient building. Hello, welcome to the Cathedral Library. Uh, you're standing or you're in a room that dates back to about 1400, but this room isn't the oldest part of the Cathedral. So we thought probably best to start with the really oldest um, date that we can go back to for the Cathedral. So the earliest foundations are from about 681 when an Anglo-Saxon kind of lord founded an abbey here at Gloucester. He gave some land and he put his sister in in charge of the abbey and for the first three generations of that abbey we were led by women and we were a mixed group of monks and nuns and priests all working and worshipping together. But you can't see any of that if you come to visit us now because all of that has been eroded and kind of rebuilt since by many different generations. So the building you actually see if you come to the cathedral today, its foundation stone was laid in 1089. That's many generations ago now but it's also right in the peak of a period of Norman building. And that's not someone called Norman, but that's William the Conqueror. So William the Conqueror, who comes over from France and uh, wins the Battle of Hastings and then proceeds to take over the country of England from the previous uh, ruling classes. And he brings his knights with him and he came from Normandy in France and that's where the Normans come from. So we are, we're kind of the building you see and that we're now part of all comes from those Norman foundations. Um, so Becky, who designed the cathedral? We don't really know. So all of our records, all of our uh, documents that we have about the cathedral talk about the, the abbots, so the men who were in charge of our abbey at the time and and talk about them as the the kind of the rulers as the people in charge so you get the name of serlo abbot serlo our first norman abbot that william the conqueror appointed and we know it's his master plan but i can't believe that he ever got a chisel out and actually chipped away at a stone himself or ever decided kind of quite what angle to do on a pillar so probably he had norman masons working alongside him they may also have been working on Tewkesbury Abbey as well at about the same time, 
also on some of the churches around Gloucestershire as well and just over the borders as well. So we know we've got connections to a church up at Kilpeck just over in Herefordshire where a lot of the stones and the style of carving is really similar. But unfortunately, although we've got beautiful stones and wonderful buildings, none of those masons ever wrote down their names. So we don't know who it was who actually laid out exactly what angles we should use in the building. Do we know how long the cathedral took to finish? It's an interesting question. Um, and it's really difficult to be certain, but we know that the east end of the cathedral, so from the high altar, so that's our, our kind of easterly point, to where the organ is in the cathedral, that was built in 11 years. And once they'd built that, it was able to be consecrated and they could start using it. They then took another 30 years to complete the nave, which is the west end. So I'm kind of pointing behind you as you're sitting at home watching this video. I've got a cathedral behind you that's kind of extending at that end. So yeah, the nave took about 30 years to, to build after that. So they finished about 11.30. They finished the nave. But almost immediately, they start to repair it and start to build extra buildings. So they start building all the buildings that the, the monks lived in around the cloisters. They set out the cloisters itself, that kind of square of green space with a corridor all the way around it that you could process around, that you could take kind of meditative walks around, but also that they worked and lived in. So we know they studied their books in that space. We know that they um, went through there to wash their hands, ready to go to dinner in those spaces. Beyond that, 100 years later they're putting a new roof on the nave, 200 years later they're demolishing the whole of our east wall, so our biggest wall, and replacing it with a wall of glass, which is the great east window. And even later than that, in 1450, they build the tower, which is kind of up behind us up that way, and this room probably matches to that, so it's about the same time as the, the tower. Have any of the original drawings and plans survived? No, is the quickest answer, except there are little fragments sometimes around our buildings. Because actually our Norman masons and even our medieval masons didn't take a piece of paper and draw it out with a pen and ink or with, paper, with a pencil. What they did was they'd have either layers of sand that they could draw their patterns in and then wipe them away and draw the next one that they wanted to draw. Or they put a really thin layer of plaster on top of a stone and used that to scratch the, the patterns they wanted to use. And we find some of those lines still on some of our stones. So some of the biggest flat stones that we've got around, in particular there's one which is a fireplace, the top of a fireplace in one of our buildings, that has still got the scratches of the masons kind of marking out just how wide this pillar is going to be and what the curve's going to be on that stone and you've got it still kind of because they scratched it just too hard and it went through into the stone and got left there forever. Who looks after the building now? Uh, so now we are we are a cathedral so I've mentioned that we were an abbey a number of times we actually stopped being an abbey in 1540 as part of the dissolution of the monasteries and I'm sure there'll be lots that you can learn about the dissolution of the monasteries in other videos and other podcasts as well um, but we then became a cathedral and from that point onwards from 1541 onwards we have had a group of people called the dean and chapter and they are the kind of the authority they are the, the kind of our bosses they're the people who look after us and make sure we've got everything we need that we're getting enough money to be able to cover all of our costs, that we have enough stone to keep repairing the building and maintaining it. But the people who actually get their hands dirty are our wonderful team of masons, led by Pascal, our master mason, who came across from France, I think about 20 years ago, and has just a wealth of experience and knowledge. And they still use exactly the same techniques that those masons would have used when they first built it a thousand years ago. And are they still making changes and adding new things? Very little, but yes, where, where we can and where it's safe to do so without losing something that's really important to us of our past. Um, so one of the noticeable changes we made quite recently was during a thing called Pilgrim. And we had this um, project to try and 
kind of reawaken the cathedral, to renew it and bring a bit new, more new life into the cathedral. And as part of that, we wanted to make sure that everyone who came to the cathedral, no matter what your ability to walk or whether you needed a wheelchair or a stick or you were able to run the whole length of the cathedral in two seconds, whichever you were, we wanted you to be able to get to every bit of the ground floor that we could without needing someone else to kind of help you get there. And so we put lifts in, which was the first time we'd ever had lifts Kind of physical lifts like the ones we've got. Before that we had really awful looking old um, kind of uh, very medical looking lifts that you would have, you would have thought were totally um, kind of right to have in, in a hospital helping you getting in and out of a, a bed but not something you'd want to have to get yourself into to just go up about six steps in the cathedral. Um, and as part of that one of the things we also did was take out a pillar that had been in our lady chapel doorway. So in our Lady Chapel doorway, we'd always had this pillar for about 100 years that supported the lintel. So the lintel is the big bit of stone that goes across the top of the doorway. We took this pillar out and we could do that because we could find photographs and documents from before it had been put in. So we could prove we were actually just putting it back to how it had been before. But in doing that, they had to make a new lintel that could take the weight of the Great East Window above it all on its own. And on that lintel, if you go and have a look at it, we've got a few little added extras. So there is one lovely carved salamander on the inside of the Lady Chapel, which was carved by one of our, our masons who helped carve the stone as kind of his signature. That kind of, we couldn't have his name carved on it, but his little, his salamander's there for future. That's wonderful. Thank you, Becky. Just before we stop, just what's the best part of your job? Oh, I, there are so many gorgeous parts of it. I love the excitement of opening a box that I don't know what's in there and finding out that actually it's just full of accounts and financial records and maybe I'm not as interested in that box after all. I love being able to come into this building and this space and just kind of uh, breathe the history that surrounds us all the time. You might be able to hear a little bit in the background, there's often music that drifts up to this room because choristers practice just below my feet. So I'm surrounded by music, which is so rare for an archivist because normally in archives and libraries you're in a quiet space so that everyone can con concentrate. And here I have that, but I have it with added musical background, which is so lovely. Um, but the best thing actually is getting to meet the people of the past of the cathedral through the documents and through the books that they leave behind and that I get to handle and look after. Thank you so much Becky. So thank you very much to Becky, we hope you enjoyed that and it must be really wonderful getting to work in somewhere quite as amazing um, as Gloucester Cathedral and particularly their library is really beautiful. If any of you get a chance to go and visit it it's wonderful, it's up a little spiral staircase. Um, so we're now going to move on to castles. So what is a castle? Well, a castle is a building which has been created to defend those people inside from attack and it was also used to control a local area around it. Uh, most castles were built hundreds of years ago and they were built by either royalty or by noble, noble people um, who thought that it would be good to be able to control the area. And later on, when castles were no longer needed, such as there weren't any more battles or any war going on, quite often those castles were turned into palaces where people entertained each other and they had all these fabulous parties and exciting times. And it was less about worrying about people attacking them and more about um, impressing people with this wonderful building. Um, so now we've got the castle quiz in front of us. Now, these are some think questions for you. In other words, these are looking at some of the aspects, the features of the cathedral and having a bit of a think about um, what they were there for and how they were used. Um, at this point, I suggest that the teacher pauses the film and goes through each of these four things and asks you uh, the answer to each one. OK, so I hope you managed to get to the bottom of what each of these things were. Um, you might have been quite surprised by some of them. 
So we're now going to move on to doing the drawing activity. So in front of you, you're going to need your paper, your pencil ruler, sharpener and rubber. And we're going to be playing you three videos, um, each of them uh, with Jamie, an artist who will be teaching you how to draw in perspective using what he calls the two point perspective. Now, he's going to start off by showing you how to draw a cuboid. So that's in the image you see at the top. The second one, he's going to show you how to draw um, a very solid um, rectangle. And finally, using those skills that you'll have learned, you're going to go on to draw this fantastic castle um, using the two point perspective. Um, now, don't worry um, if you can't quite keep up. Do your best. Have a go. Um, take your time and don't forget that if you don't keep up with Jamie, you can always take a bit of time afterwards to have a go at this. Thank you. Here's the first video. Hello, this is James Fegs and I'm a professional artist and today I'm going to be taking you through, through how to do two point perspective drawing. So to do this, you need a pencil, a ruler and a piece of paper to draw on. Uh, so to start with, uh, the first mark that you may need to make on the uh, uh, on the piece of paper is your horizontal line. Uh, so this is technically where the sky meets the ground. So I'm going to draw a line right, roughly in the middle of the page, like so. And then at either end, I'm going to put a vanishing point. So this is the point where the object will disappear to on, on, on either side. And I'm going to name that A and B. So we're going to draw a cube. And to do this, we can first insert a horizontal line in the middle of the page. Like so, roughly equal distance between uh, uh, the, the top side of the horizontal line and the bottom side. And now, uh, when we draw over on this side, uh, we, uh, we're always going to go to the vanishing point B. And when we're drawing over this side, we're going to uh, vanishing point A. Uh, so to do this top of the cube, we're always going to end up at the vanishing point. Like so. Into here. And then for the bottom of the cube, we're going to do the same again. From the centre to vanishing point A, and then from the centre again to vanishing point B. So that's where the uh, ends of the um, of the uh, of the site of the object, if it was to continue, would vanish at the horizon. So now we're going to uh, draw the line because it's a box that we're drawing. Uh, it's not going to go all the way to the end of the vanishing point, so we're going to put the side in to make a square. And then roughly, to make a square, we're going to put it about here. And about the same equal distance over this side. There we go. So, now you can see it's starting to get a cube form. Uh, then the next thing to do is to, to then match up and get the sides matching up with the vanishing points from the top and on the bottom. So this, po this point here will go to vanishing point B. And then this point here will go to vanishing point A. Always going to the opposite side. Then we do the same over this side. So on the, on the B side, this is gonna go to A. And on the A side, this is going to go to B. And you can see, we're starting to get the uh, the top and the bottom of the cube. Now we, uh, we've got a rubber, so, um, so now we can start rubbing out uh, a few of the lines to make the cube. So we can take off this horizontal line here. Then we can take off this line here. That's not part of the cube. Let me take this one. And 
and then we can take this one. And then what you can do then is then go around again and thicken up the line. You can draw a drawing over. make the cube uh, and now, as you can see uh, this is a, a see-through cube so you could see And just go over these lines again. You can see the, the top and the bottom from the other side, from behind. And that's uh, it's how to draw a cube. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed um, watching Jamie in the first video. Uh, we're now going to move on to the second one, uh, where you're going to be having a go at drawing a rectangular shape. Now we're going to draw a rectangle cuboid. Uh, the other one was a, a square uh, cube. This time we're going to do a rectangle. And um, also this time this is not going to be see-through like well, the cube was. So first start with the horizontal line again. And then mark your vanishing points. So a dot here and name that A. And put a dot here and name that B. Uh, and then this time I'm going to start my vertical line. I'm going to start it slightly over from the centre to show that it's a rectangle. And again, uh, uh, draw a line that's roughly equal distance from the top uh, above the line to below the line. And then from the top, I'm going to go from here, I'm going to go to vanishing point B. And at the bottom, I'm going to go to again to vanishing point B. And then over on the left hand side, I'm going to go to vanishing point A from the top. And the same again from the bottom. Now I'm going to uh, draw the side of the cube, similar to what we did with the, uh, the square. So it's it there like that. And then, and then because this is longer, we're going to go longer into the vanishing point. And we're going to go to here. And then all I need to do is then take, take out the marking lines and then I can take out the vanishing point lines over what we've uh, what we've drawn just in case we've rubbed out any of the line out and just go over the lines again like so and this one just done this line out And there we have a cuboid rectangle. Thank you. And I hope you managed to um, really get an idea now you've done the two of them of how to do the lines and how to do it in perspective. Because now what we're going to move on to is showing how you can use these skills to draw a really fantastic castle. Um, so off we go. Thank you. Right, we're now going to use what we've learned from uh, making a simple cuboid uh, in a square format and rectangle format using two point perspective to a building and uh, the building we're going to do is a castle. So, um, so first I'm going to start with my horizontal line, the centre of the page, then going to put the points right at the end the vanishing points, name them A and B. And then 
to start with, we are vertical line is going to be in the centre of the page. We're going to do equal distance from the, from the top of the line to the bottom of the line. And that will be the height of the castle. Like so. And then we're going to draw our vanishing points from the right hand side and the left hand side of the castle. To show the side of the building. Oh. Like so, and at the bottom to point A, and the top here goes to point A. Okay, so next we're going to do the, uh, the side of the castle, and I'm going to do about halfway between the um, centre uh, of the castle and the end of the page. Like so here. And on the right hand side, I guess the same again. You see here we've made a cube. And so now we're going to put the, uh, the a castle has turrets, so we're going to put the we're going to put the turrets in. So we'll put the first one in here to make it uh, it's in the foreground, so it's going to be quite large. So we're going to make it from about this so far from the centre, and again here. Like so, and then from here on the side, and it's uh, it's going to be slightly smaller because uh, uh, because um, it gets smaller the further you go into the vanishing point, the uh, elements of the uh, of the building. So I'm gonna this size, and again over this side, and the top. Um, then we're going to do a. Uh, a curve to show it's a round to it uh, rather than uh, rather than square for this one so I'm going to put the I'm going to put the curve in like so I'm going to do the same over the that side and then I can actually rebate that point there and that creates a, <coughs> a round front to it and then we're going to do the same over here. So this time we're going to the two. It's going to finish about here. So we're going to keep it in line with uh, the end. So we're going to make a mark here to keep that the same distance and the same here. And then do the same over this side. So the line there. It's about it's about there. And then from here about there. And then I'm going to create a curve here, and then a curve here. The same again, curve there. The same again, a curve there. We can then use that marker here to create the wall of the of the castle. So that the line is going to go to that point there, and all the way through to to vanishing point A. Like so. And then here, we'll do the same here. So this point here will go all the way to vanishing point A and that'll give me, this, give me the, how uh, far back this wall needs to go in the front, in the, in the foreground. Uh, all the way to vanishing point A. Do the same over this side. vanishes so it always gets smaller the further it goes back the same again there we go so a castle has uh, battlements uh, that really characterize the building being a castle and these are used for uh, uh, the army uh, for, um, using bow and arrows uh, to fight off attackers of the castle. So I'm going to put these in. So I'm going to create a line about so high. And that again goes to vanishing point. Uh, and I'll do the same over this side. So it's going to vanishing point A. Notice that now I can just miss off 
the uh, line here so I don't need to rub out and uh, and then from here uh, what I'm going to do then is make these battlements so like so and as it goes further back they it will they get thinner As it always gets smaller the further back you go and do the same here Pull in that line. and then it'll stay the sides a bit thinner like so and then what we can do then is do the same at the top of the castle so we can uh, so we can in Stand up at the same height, do another curve. Let's make this curve a little bit more. And then we'll do the same again. And then go from thin. And it gets larger, more four, more into the foreground you go. Like so. And then we can rub out these lines here. I can do the same here. And then we can do the same on the on these further away back. So these won't be as high because it's in the it's in the background, so they're a lot smaller. So again, do a bit the line that the curve line that joins them up. Okay, now we can rub out the central line. We no longer need this. But you could use in the faint uh, uh rubbed out line of the centre. You can um, make a, a small window, so you can just, this will be a thin slip that they use to fire arrows from bows from here, and then this can then just go using your ruler. It's very thin, straight down. That's so far, and the same again. And then across, and we can do that on all the turrets. So we're about the same size here, and this will be the where the where the um, the centre is. So about here, it's a lot thinner this time because it's in the in the background. Do the same again. Right, so now what we can do, we can rub this line out here. Um, with this one that's there and now you're getting the shape of the castle now we can do a drawbridge so to do this we can create a door here we can go straight up like so and notice it's wider here than it is here because as we say it gets smaller as you go into the distance and then from the top Work out where the top, how high you want it to be. So I'm going to say it's from here. From this point, I'm going to take that to point A. Like so. I can then draw a curve over the top. Like so. And then, uh, from here, we can draw the, the, uh, the bridge, which comes out. And we can, we're going to use point B 
to make this line of the drawbridge. So that will go from here to point B. Like so. And the same again. From that point of the door to point B and come out. That's it. And then how far roughly the height of this door. So about here. And then we're going to go to point A. There we go. And then what we can do, we can rub this out now. Now what we can do if we want, we can make a moat. So we're going to, uh, from again, from point A, so the moat is going to go from where the drawbridge finishes. So where that's laid down, that goes to point A. And that's going to come all the way with the centre here. And then the same again to point B. Over on this side. Out. and then this is going to come from and then on the left hand side this is going to go the edge of the moat is going to go to point b here and notice it's not as wide as it is here it's in the distance so we're going to make this a lot shorter and it goes to point b and then from this and then the same over this side it's a lot shorter it's only going to go to about here and that's going to go to point a like so and then what we can do then is uh, we can make it so there's uh, water in here so we can make it choppy like so and then the next we can draw as if it's on a bit of a hill so again an edge and we go to over this side we come to point B Like so, and then here we go to point A as to how big we want this uh, area to be in front of the moat. So we're going to go here and just come down here. That's going to go off the edge of the page, and the same again here from point B, about the same distance, and then we'll do the same again. From here, I'm going to make it roughly about, so about that far, and that's going to go to point A. Like so. Uh, and then what we can do, we can rub out these lines of the castle. We no longer require these. Out. That out. Now if we want to make this wall a bit thicker in here, the drawbridge is down, um, so we can make this thicker, we can go to point B to show the thickness of that door, of the drawbridge, and that can go to here, and that, that matches it with point B, and then from here, we can make this uh, the uh, width of this door again going to point B. So it's a big stone wall here, and then we can go straight up like so. And then for uh, and then from here, then we can just rub out the rest of the lines and lift, be left with a, a standing castle. So from here, I'm going to take out all the vanishing point lines. All the lines we don't need. Same again here. And the same again there. And there. And then just go over the lines that we've partially rubbed over by accident. Second, I just thought my 
my pen. I'm just trying to lead in my pen. One more moment. Okay, that's just going to say. Okay. Just going to go over these lines just to mark them. That's where the moat is. And then we're going to do the same over this side. We can take out these vanishing lines now. So we're left with just a freestanding castle. Marking lines and then just redo it over. These lines again. Turn that one out. And there we have a castle in two point perspective. Thank you, and I hope you managed to keep up. Um, if you didn't, don't worry, keep working at it. I think now you've probably got the idea of how it all works, you can have a go at this anyway. Um, don't forget, after you've drawn, drawn your castle, you can also add in um, some more windows, some people, a flag maybe. You could have some people firing arrows and that kind of thing from the battlements. Um, and don't forget, you can also put some colour, some shading and that sort of thing, whatever you really like to do. Um, this might also be a great idea if you're in class to have a look at each other's drawings and see what you found difficult, what you found easy um, and see where you want to go with this next. Thank you. So that now leaves us to talk about our uh, next session. Um, so our next session is going to be um, Passport to the Past, Tykes, Ragamuffins and Scallywags. We're going to be looking at children, punishment and the law. As always, it will be the first Wednesday um, of the month at four o'clock till five. And for this session, um, we're going to be joined by Sue Webb. And Sue Webb is a former police officer and also an expert on the history of Gloucestershire Police Force. Um, the archives hold many examples of children being assaulted, caned, beaten and made to stand in, an, uh, in the corner for hours. Um, young children could even be made to do hard labour or imprisoned. And these records that we're going to be looking at really help to show how attitudes towards children have changed over the years. Not all that long ago, teachers used to physically punish their students. Uh, the cane, the slipper and the ruler were all used to beat naughty children in class. And we're going to look at some examples of the kinds of punishments children used to receive in and out of school. And you are going to be the one who is going to decide if you think uh, children really were naughty and whether the punishment was fair. So make sure for next session, you've got your thinking caps on because we're going to be asking you um, what you think of how we used to treat children. Okay, I hope to see you next month. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>